Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Catholic Talk Show. Today, we're going to be looking at all of the stuff that's on the Catholic Church altar. That's right. We're taking a look and explaining sacred vessels, and they're the tools and the receptacles used for the consecration of the holy and precious blood and body of our Lord Jesus Christ. And these tools that you see in front of you are very near and dear to the practice of my everyday life as a Catholic priest. Good to be back in the studio. Now, for you guys listening on podcast, we're going to try to explain some of this stuff that's very familiar to you, but I think most of all, we're going to be getting a lot out of the explanation of, of, of these sacred vessels, too, as well. So if you're watching us on YouTube, you can go ahead and click that like and well, I'll subscribe. Just let you subscribe. Is it subscribe and yeah. then the bell? Do Thumbs the up, subscribe, bell. And for those who t- typically listen in, Check us out on YouTube, you know, because this is a great episode because I'd love to share some of my sacred vessels that I use at every single Mass that I celebrate. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Sacred vessels really are mysterious things. They're beautiful works of craftsmanship. Mm -hmm. They really are. And they represent the, the great beauty of the Catholic Church. And they are all oriented towards the most precious thing that the Church possesses, which is the gift that Christ gives to us from Calvary, his precious blood and body. Mm-hmm. And these vessels really are meant to be worthy of, of holding and transmitting the grace of the, of the <clears> sacraments, <throat> but truly holding blood, body, blood, soul, and divinity our Lord. So mm-hmm. we want to present yeah. the best that we can offer mm-hmm. for the King of Kings. Yeah, and that's why it's appropriate to have them in precious metals. Mm-hmm. And, and they are precious treasures of the church and are typically kept within safes because we want to keep these sacred objects and these sacred vessels very, very safe and use them with great reverence. Because when we think about what we do as Catholics in memory of what Christ has done in the upper room, that deserves every amount of festival, every amount of artistry, every amount of, of, of expression. And I, I just cherish these, uh, cherish these vessels that you see in front of you. Yeah. I, I was, uh, over at the church getting these with father Pagano and I was just like, yeah, I never really held this stuff before. It's really kind of an honor mm-hmm. because of what happens in them. You know, it's like Jesus comes through, through his priesthood yeah, I was hesitant. Makes himself to, present. I was hesitant to even touch any of this yeah. because it just feels really it's fascinating. It, it's sacred. It really mm-hmm. is. Yeah, it is sacred. Apart. That's right. That's right. Now you mentioned that these are you know precious metals, and, and that's really actually a requirement that these vessels, anything that comes into contact with the consecrated host or wine, has to be gold. Okay. Huh. Now these vessels are not. Likely, Father Rich, correct me if I'm wrong, solid gold. Mm -mm, No. That would be cost prohibitive for almost every parish in the world besides maybe the Vatican and a few churches. But still, any of the surfaces that come in contact with the sacred species, according to paragraph 328 of the general instruction of the Roman Missal, says that it must be at least plated or gilded in gold. Gold inlaid. Right. So, Mm -hmm. you know, they might be silver, which is more affordable, and then plated in gold. What are most of them, Father? Are they like pewter, Pewter? uh, you know, nickel, tin, tin, um, you know, and and a lot of times it's just the plating on the outside that is is the gold. And specifically, it is a requirement that the inside be gold. Yes. Because Mm -hmm. that is the part that comes in contact Mm -hmm. with the blood or, you know, on the... um, Mm. Other implements. So we're going to talk a bit about... And, and in fact, let me actually show you one that I have right here. Okay. As a matter of fact, these are uh, clay, and wow. then the inlay is gold. And these were, these were uh, made in Ravenna mm-hmm. and hand-painted uh, with gold. And yeah, those yeah, do- if you're not watching, this is basically like a mosaic... On the outside of the chalice and the what is that called a a, a ciborium ciborium yeah mm-hmm. so and we're gonna get into the names of all these things but yeah. those those really do those look are kind beautiful, of beautiful dude northern Italian with like mm-hmm. that Byzantine tradition mm-hmm. very beautiful do you want to yeah. go yeah it's very very pretty yeah but yeah that inside is very nice looking gold mm-hmm. but that's because it comes into contact with it so let's talk a little bit about what each of these things are how you use them during the celebration of the Mass. Um, 
So where would you typically, you know, when you start getting into the Eucharist, Eucharistic prayers and you start getting into the consecration, where do you start? What, what is all this stuff? So uh, where, where you start, if you're, if you're preparing for Mass, the first and foremost uh, you know, thing to do is to prepare your saboria and your chalice and patent. So okay, what are those? What's, principal, those. what's principal to this is uh, your chalice. So you want to start with your chalice and your patent first, which is in front of me. On top of the chalice is what's called the corporal. So the corporal <clears throat> is what catches the corpus of Christ in case there was a fragment or, or a piece of the, uh, the blessed sacrament. And that, that looks like an ironed piece of big white cloth. White, yeah. It's a, a white, white cloth, linen cloth. It's stiff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and you would unfold it, you know, when you're celebrating mass, this would go on top of the altar and then your chalice would go, uh, in the middle of the, the corporal. And then the next piece that you would, if you're if you're preparing for mass, is your pall. So this is a this is my own personal pall. I have used every celebration at at my home parish wherever I've been from the time I was first ordained. Um, I always celebrate mass with this pall. It's the coat of arms of Saint John Paul II. Um, he's been <clears throat> the greatest inspiration and educator in in how I should be a priest. And uh, so I, I celebrate every mass with that pall. So that looks like I don't know what does that look like to you. It's kind of it's, okay. it's 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 a square cardboard. It's probably about five inches by five inches that goes over the top of the next item that he's going to go into. But mm -hmm. it's kind of a stiff square yeah. cardboard with with decorative. fabric. Yeah, and it's decorative it. too. Mm -hmm. And then the next is the patent. So the the pall goes on top of the patent, and then you have an unconsecrated host, as you as you see here. You place the unconsecrated That's host. That's the priest's host. What's the yep, purpose this is of the, the pall? The pall goes on top of the patent. It's just kind of. So the pall, the pall typically, as you'll, as you'll see in a moment, um, it will go over the chalice um, in case there was a bug or a fly oh, okay. or something like flying around. So, so there's a like practical. So like a lid? Yeah. yeah. So you, you kind of put. It's a lid. Yeah. You put that on top and you're always going to deal with a fly at some point yeah. um, mm -hmm. in your priesthood. And then underneath the, uh, the patent and the unconsecrated host, you have, which is a golden, it's a golden dish, essentially, is the pattern, thin, very thin, thin plate. and curved um, to keep the presider's host in the middle. And then your purificator goes over the chalice um, underneath the pattern. So you would take that off and place it on your corporal. And then your chalice is then prepared for, uh, you know, the, the, the rituals um, of offertory. And when the chalice is the cup that you... You prepare the blood of Christ in. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this chalice, in fact, was uh, gilded in Germany and given in honor of Generosa and Giuseppe Fusco uh, for a brother priest, Father Joe Fusco, who passed away. He was the one who built St. Anthony of Padua and Ozone Park um, in Queens. And this was given to me by his nephew, Joe Fusco, uh, leading up to my ordination, and I cherish it. It's something that I would have envisioned, and if I, would, if I had the ability to make my own chalice, I would literally make this chalice. It has my birthstone in it, ruby for July, and it has all of these amazing uh, images of Christ, these symbols of Christ, like the unicorn, which we've mentioned in, in past is, episodes. And this is very decorative, too. I mean, this has an incredible, very you know... Uh, metalwork on it. Um, it's got apostles on the bottom. You have uh, the signs of the um, evangelists there around the base, uh, almost like stained glass windows or arches yeah. around the, the the stem. I mean, it's pretty elaborate, but I think it's that, that that is a beautiful chalice. Thank you. Yeah, I love it. The pelicans on here, the lamb that was slain, the lion of Judah, you know, the eagle, <coughs> um, the sparrow. I mean, it's it's beautiful. The sacred heart of Jesus. You know, and that's, that's a great thing that if you want to make a donation to the church that lasts a long time and then right. also offers grace, I mean, the parents of this priest are still participating in the mass every day through their donation. And I mean, it's certainly expensive, but I don't think it's so outrageously expensive that most people couldn't actually afford to donate one. Yeah. So, I mean, 
if and, you're ever thinking about something like a donation to a church, ask your priest about a new chalice. Yeah, and the encouragement would be, you know, to to not do something, you know, inexpensive because this is central to the, you know, the practice of our faith and what we cherish the most is the Blessed Sacrament, and something absolutely beautiful mm -hmm. uh, is called for. Yep. You know, Saint Francis of Assisi mm -hmm. would support that concept. Saint John Vianney and many saints throughout the history of the church. Um, you know, now you could you could pick up a, a chalice that is very very inexpensive, but most likely it won't be used by by a, well, a priest or I whatever. Mean, especially nowadays, but when you're talking the seventies and the eighties, when you have some pretty rock and boomer masses, I mean, you get like glass chalices. And that's and that's what I mean. Like you know, you don't want to you don't want to buy you don't want to buy that uh, for for your priest or your parish. Yeah. Um, don't buy garbage. Yeah. yeah, you know, there's because you're not buying it just for your priest. You're buying it for everybody who celebrates through it, and also for Christ Himself. I mean, you're mm -hmm. buying. A manger. You're you're being Joseph of Arimathea by yeah, holding that holy grail. And when I celebrate Mass, I think of Joe Fusco and his wife June, who just passed away. And you know, celebrating Mass with this chalice in my hand, I lift this chalice up for the repose of the soul of of his wife. You know, of Joe's wife. Uh, you know, June Fusco. And um, it's it's just it's very special, <coughs> very very special. Now the patent. Do all that priests have attachments to their? Um, Many not, do. not as significant as yours, but I mean, oh, so a, a greater number of priests, um, you know, like they'll receive contributions from people and then they have their own chalice made. Okay. Uh, sometimes like I know Michael Nixon found a historic one in, in France uh, that he purchased. The Knights of Columbus do a great thing that if you're a member of the Knights of Columbus upon your death, they will donate a chalice in your name that is used for the celebration of your funeral mass. And then it's typically donated wow. to maybe a seminarian in a, in a poor country. Right. Beautiful. So, if there's mm -hmm. seminarians in, you know, Africa or South America or Southeast Asia, they're getting these chalices, which they probably mm -hmm. their community couldn't afford to provide. Mm -hmm. It's awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's yeah. a great thing the knights do. It really is. So, you know, this is this is how you prepare with paten and chalice. So what the patent does, I mean, mm -hmm. that's to hold the unconsecrated host. But in the Latin mass, the patent is also put under the mouth when mm -hmm. people are receiving. Mm -hmm. um, the same patent? A patent, yeah. Yeah, and this is if I'm if I'm distributing, uh, I was distributing by intinction for my deacons. Um, you know, when the when the precious blood was reserved to uh, you know the presider, so you know I would I would intinct, and I always when I when I receive communion, um, it's under the patent, you know. Um, and the same thing when I receive the precious blood, it's under the patent. Yeah, and the patent makes so much sense. Mm -hmm. I, I really wish they were more widely used because. It, its purpose is to prevent particles mm -hmm. of the Holy Eucharist from falling on the ground, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you've ever been to a Latin Mass, you're, you're kneeling at the altar rail, and the, the altar server holds the patent right under your chin, and the priest puts it right on your tongue. There is no room for mistake, right? Mm -hmm. Now, me, I've always worried about my giant bushy beard that I'm going to have little bits of Jesus stuck yeah. in it because it's not going to follow the patent, but... In general, mm -hmm. that's really mm -hmm. what it's for. Yeah, and you know, I, I I love the reverence and attention to distribution of Holy Communion in the Trinitine Rite. Um, you know, and I've been to masses where they they spread a a cloth over the altar rail, and then they have the patents come out and. Um, it's the safest way of distribution and the most reverent way of distribution. I do hope that we start moving back mm -hmm. in the direction of the communion rails of distribution. Well, only you could prevent forest you know? fires, Smokey. <laughs> <laughs> so bring it back. You're about to build a church. Well, yeah, no, no, it's true. But um, you know, when it comes to USCCB and mm -hmm. and you know the culture and and the communication from pastors, um, I'm certainly of that school uh, as well. So what we have here as well is, the, is a ciborium. It's a stem ciborium. Um, typically in parish. You'll see this type of ciborium. This has the lid on it here. So now this now for you, know, you listening, this looks like a little gold pot, you know, yeah. and one of them looks like a chalice with a lid. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's two types. Mm -hmm. One is a chalice with a lid and the other looks like a, a tiny little, you know, cooking pot with a lid on it. Yep. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a bowl to the chalice, but there's a bowl uh, sense in respect to the ciboria. Mm -hmm. It just the ciboria contains the body of Christ um, and the, or the unconsecrated hosts. Uh, this is another example of a ciboria from Ravenna that, that we're kind of showing you, uh, again, with the mosaic and the inlay of the gold. Um, that's for the distribution of communion among the, those attending mass. Yep. And in, as you can see in the ciboria from Ravenna is unconsecrated hosts uh, that would be placed on the corporal uh, in this way um, for the celebration, celebration of mass.
And now that's also used for the for uh, reserving the Eucharist if there if there's leftover. Yes. Yeah, so that then goes into the tabernacle. And that's actually what I'm what I'm going to show you now with with this ciboria, which was uh, handed down to me from the Pisco family and in, in my family. God rest my uncle Nicky, but his mother's funeral. This was from that mother's funeral. So what you were saying before, you know, like for loved ones, you know, now now I get to celebrate this. Every mass that I celebrate, I keep the Pisco family in my heart and my prayers. Um, my my parents, you know, and grandparents regilded this for me through Adrian Hammer mm -hmm. um, in New York, and they did a great job. Um, <clears throat> you know, and, and it's just, it's very, very special. You know, I'm coming up on my 10th anniversary. I'm going to have it regilded and, and prepared. This is going to be regilded and, mm -hmm. and worked with, cause as you can see, it's, there's a lot of wear and tear. Um, and then, you know, when you reserve the blessed sacrament, you can have something along this line, like, like this, which is an older veil, um, for the blessed sacrament. It would go over the ciboria as you see on camera here, um, and it's just, it's a nice way to reserve the blessed sacrament in the tabernacle for the distribution of Holy Communion to the sick. Now, it's important to state that, you know, uh, you have a pix here. Now, a pix is used when you go to distribute communion to the sick. You would uh, you receive from the priest or the deacon, the clergy, uh, you know, the blessed sacrament from, um, you know, from the tabernacle, from reserve. Um, and this is just a little small container. It looks maybe kind of like a, a makeup compact, if you're, yeah. if you're listening. Yeah. Just a small circular little container with a flip open lid. Mm -hmm. But it's definitely gold as well. What and an it's honor gold. to be able to bring the Eucharist It's a to huge somebody. honor. Like, it's a huge honor. Yeah. You yeah. know, I, I don't always love the concept of extraordinary Eucharistic ministers, ministers because most circumstances, every Sunday, even. every Sunday is not an extraordinary mm -hmm. occasion. I mean, it is, but you know what I mean? It's not extraordinary. Um, but I do really love the idea of the laity be, being able to bring the Eucharist to the homebound to the sick. And, I, and I'll tell you, you know, I'm by myself in a parish of 1,700 families. I would not be able to minister to the needs of all of my people mm -hmm. without the, the lay no. support that I have, whether it's my staff, whether it's my councils, Is there and a certainly those who bring... That they pray before yeah or? there's a communion right for laity mm -hmm. okay. when they go and visit when they visit the sick yeah when my grandpa got pretty old and couldn't really make it to mass often anymore there was a great lady she was actually my wife's uh, confirmation sponsor oh beautiful bernie and she would bring the eucharist to my grandpa and it was really a bringing the eucharist to the homebound and assisting the priest especially in today's world very important. So if you've ever thought, hey, I want to be a Eucharistic minister, maybe think about that first. Yeah. Because that's probably the more practical and needed application. It really, it really is. And, you know, a point that I want to make too is as, as a presider, something that I'm always trying to aim for is consecrating the hosts for the particular liturgy for the people that are in attendance. Mm -hmm. and, and you don't want to have an overabundance of reserve of the Blessed Sacrament. The only reason to reserve the Blessed Sacrament from the very beginnings is really for the distribution to the sick mm -hmm. and to the dying for viaticum. Mm -hmm. But, um, you how know, often do you, how often the do you outside know of that is right adoration, on adoration too, like adoration of the Blessed Sacrament, the reserved Blessed Sacrament came later in the, in the mm -hmm. practice of reserving the Blessed Sacrament. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I do try to aim at having the appropriate amount of hosts consecrated and those who are in attendance at that particular liturgy receive the Eucharist consecrated at that particular liturgy. That is the point that we try to aim at. Um, and that's what I've been trying to, how I've been trying to form my my sacristans as well in preparation for the Have you the ever mass. gotten the number right on? Oh, yeah. It happens? To, yeah, to the actual host. Mm. Absolutely. Like that's, on a Sunday? Or maybe Sunday, a Sunday is tough, but uh, you know there was one time where my deacon, Deacon Jose, who prepared all of the sacred vessels for the mass, um, he forgot to put hosts to for uh, like the appropriate number of hosts. Mm -hmm. So we only consecrated a little, and then we went into reserve, and it got to the point where I was looking at how many people were at Saint Elizabeth. We had a huge parish, and I had to take all of the Blessed Sacrament back into my to my ciboria. And I distributed one by one. It took a long time, and I was breaking into fours. Then I was breaking into eighths, and I and everybody was receiving on the tongue at that point. 
And um, and I was able to distribute to the very last fragment of the Blessed Whoa. Sacrament, and everybody erupted with with applause at the end of it. It was just Whoa. like a it was a miracle that we were it able to like get through. It was like a less impressive uh, fish and loaves. Yeah, it was definitely yeah. a less impressive, but it was it was equally like an inspiring miracle because my heart was like, you know, oh, God, man. like please, I'm begging you, <laughs> yeah. you know. Have you ever not had enough? Um, it, thank God it's never happened. It's it, we've come close a couple of times. That would be wow. That would be a thing. Yeah, yeah. So bummer. What else do we got out here? So um, what what else we have here is a relic of Saint John Paul II. Um, typically, you know, by tradition, every altar stone would have contained a relic, and and um, excuse me. <laughs> Did you just sneeze after kissing a relic? Woo! I want blessings, God man. God bless you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank I'll, you. I'm not thank kissing you. that thing after you guys. <laughs> well, Gross. The bottom. You um, so there, it, the, it, what's, what's traditional is that there would be a first-class relic um, at the altar. Of the saint of the church. Of the saint of the church. So this is St. John Paul II. Um, since we do not have a permanent altar at this point, you know we're we're in the process of doing fundraising, so please support Saint John Paul II, um, Catholic Church in Nocatee. But we're going to be ultimately um, embedding this beautiful first class relic of Saint John Paul in the, in the altar, and then we'll have we have actually three first class relics of Saint John Paul II. One of them will be on display, and another one will be in the sacristy. And that's a neat thing. I think I, I discovered late in my faith that every altar since the beginning has always been offered over the bones of our beloved saints. And the altar where you were confirmed at <clears throat> resurrection in Arlington contains the relics of St. Anthony. And do you know St. Anthony's last name? Padua. St. <laughs> <laughs> Anthony of Padua. Um, and your middle name is Ryan Anthony. Delacrosse. Yeah. And you just adopted St. Anthony <laughs> as your confirmation name. A little bit late. A little bit I mean, late. Hey, better late than but never. Better late than never. You know, <laughs> and we'll get into a few more of these, but I, you know, I think it really is important to, again, to stress how beautiful they are and how they are gilded in gold. I mean, these things are not cheap. They're certainly not free. And they're not free like Hollow, the number one Catholic app on the Catholic app stores. So if you go to catholictalkshow.com forward slash hollow, you can get hollow completely free on us. And Ryan, why would you not Tell want us about hollow. Catholic. Hollow is free. Well, more than that, <laughs> why would you want it? I, I, I love it for the prayers, the guided meditations. You can't beat it. Union with God is our, our heart's desire, and they guide you to meditation and union with our lo beloved Lord through prayer. Uh, but there's all sorts of other things in this app. There's music, chant. Uh, Jonathan Rumi, Jesus in the Chosen, is reading bedtime stories now. And there's uh, just got an email for 30 days of a uh, 30 day challenge uh, with him. They got Bishop Barron. They got Father Mike Schmidt. Am I explaining this or are you explaining this? Look, I'm just trying to help you out, man. I'm just giving you, you the oop. You just need to just chill out, all right? All right. <laughs> I use this app more, okay? <laughs> So there's Every also day. there's also uh, Father Mike Schmitz. Oh, there is. Uh, I didn't know that. Podcast in a day. Uh, there's bedtime, uh, nighttime things where you can you know try to relax and go to sleep. There's uh, liturgy of the hours. There's all sorts of stuff in this. Sounds uh, like an exciting app. app. And again, how can people get that for free? They go to CatholicTalkShow.com forward slash Hollow. Really? And then they get it for free. That's really generous of us. I know. We're givers, though. I know. And so is Hollow. I know. <laughs> it's the number one app. Why would you not want it? Well, I mean, why would you also not want a tremendous education? Maybe From the right? number one Catholic university, my alma mater, Ave Maria University, 40 undergrad degrees, so many different master's programs, pre-law, pre-med. I mean, they've got some outstanding programs. They've got a great school of arts and practice of, of the traditions of you know, dramatic, you know, uh, acting, acting and everything. And they everything. So they have like marine biology, they have business, they have nursing. So Ave Maria is very unique because it is an incredibly faithful university that helps you find your vocation, your calling from God. And at the heart of that fidelity is a perpetual adoration chapel where you could go to adoration of the Blessed Sacrament any time of the day or night, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 
the people of the community, the teachers, faculty, staff, you know, everybody, all the students, there's great devotion among the student body of Ave Maria. The but it's also an excellent school. I mean, you get a great education. So you're being nourished intellectually, but spiritually. There's that balance there. And that's yeah. how they help you find your vocation. Your calling in life. I was a grad of 2008, and it was clearly, you know, for me personally, I've been studying for 13 years in different universities, like seven different universities. For me, Ave Maria was number one, and it was the golden years of my academic formation and also my social life. Like, that's I developed cool. some of the greatest friendships of my lifetime there. So yes, if you're yeah. interested in learning more for you or if someone that you love, go to AveMaria.edu. Yeah, Ave, Ave is just such a great university. I love going back there every single year for the youth conferences. So keep an eye out for youth conferences every year in the summer. And if you want to do a visit, give a call to admissions. They would love to host you and show you around the beautiful campus of Ave Maria. That's right. right. So I got a question. I think I've seen this before. Is this the... Uh, oh, dude. Oh, my gosh. There's no water in this thing. How did it do there's that? There's a sponge. <laughs> there's a sponge. I use this <laughs> thing all the time, man. There's a sponge inside. I'm sorry. That's called an aspergillum. Okay, <laughs> oh, put okay. it down, Ryan. <laughs> okay. There's no water there. I didn't think there put was water in the fire. Okay. That is an aspergillum. <laughs> you you got blasted. I did. Well, you know, one of my favorite things Renew is... Renew the vows of your renewing baptism, Renewing the vow, vows of baptism and That's sprinkling people. Now, you know, there's also a broom that I have, which is more of like a European practice. Oh, I like that. Oh, up. yeah. The, and it's great because it just soaks up a ton of holy water. <laughs> And you could just you flip. can see it. It's so like and it's like raining here. down. So that's the aspergillum. Is the 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 holy water bucket name anything? Yeah, it's uh, it's named the holy water bucket, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> well, your bucket's got a hole in it. There's and a hole in that bucket. No it's water. holy. It's holy. It's a hole in that bucket. Uh, it's holy. Amen. No. Okay. <laughs> well, I didn't get any. We're you didn't fighting. get any? There you go. Ah, We're ah, with, ah, dude, right in the eye. Don't be so liberal ourselves. with that holy oh, water. I'm there. very liberal with holy water. We got to sprinkle and renew, man. So, how often do you use that? Do you use that for every mass? No, the, but there is a there's an option for sprinkling, right? Um, I typically use this during Easter. Easter yeah, dude, um, we got holy water in my ear. I hope you know. I hope I can hear. You better need now. to listen, okay? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> dude, point blank holy water into the ear, dude. That's awesome. I, I'm good. I, I'm very good, man. God, give me the grace to hear the gospel more clearly. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So, yeah, I I use this uh, quite frequently. Uh, all the time at, at funerals, um, you know, for committals. And then, you know, if I bless people's uh, rings for marriage, mm -hmm. um, the renewal of baptismal vows, mm -hmm. bl blessing people's cars as they come up to uh, have their new car blessed or something. So I use this quite frequently. Um, I love it. I do I do prefer the, uh, the you broom. Know, the broom. Yeah, much, much more. But uh, yeah, it's, it's great. I love when we renew baptismal vows at Easter and do the sprinkling right and sprinkle over the people. And, and it's, it's so spiritual and, and inspiring. So kind of keeping with the theme of, of water based, uh, yeah. you know, this is vessels. the only, these are the only sacred vessels that aren't gold. Does that make them not sacred vessels? Well, they're not coming in contact with anything that's been consecrated. They don't need to be. Okay. Right? But it's, it's for offertory and preparation. So, so why don't you show everyone what these, these are? These are, it's a cruet. There you go. So it's a glass cruet and bowl. This looks like a little milk jug. Yep. And, and this looks like a ramekin. Yeah. And, and you know, or, you know, like a, a dispenser for oil or vinegar or something like that. So that would be a great dish for macaroni and cheese. That would be like for a little baby, maybe. Yeah, no, no, that, you know, that's like, like a side. That's like an applesauce dish. Yeah. Applesauce dish, Fair definitely. I mean, it's a ramekin, or maybe like you put your remoulade. So or back your, to the uh, mass, people. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm hungry. What you keep? In, I'm hungry too. What you keep in cruets is wine and water for the preparation of the chalice. So you would place the wine in. Like if you ever go to a fancy restaurant, they bring out your so you'd your have Manhattan in a cruet and then pour it in your glass for you. You know. So you have two of them. One Could we wine. please stay on subject here? So there's two. Two cruets, water and, and wine. wine. Yeah, okay. And then for the washing of the hands, too, you would have the cruet. And that would with be the, the altar server. Yep, You'd be holding like your hand. Like this, and I would say, wash, wash me away my, from yeah. my sins. Cleanse me of my sins. More, more. Yep. Yeah. And then towel. And then I would be prepared the purificator. to. purificator. Yeah, and then I would be prepared to celebrate uh, Mass. Okay. So the, 
the purificator. That is that. So after mass is over, you you swish around some water and the chalice. Yeah, how do you put this stuff away? How do you clean it and get it ready so, for next time? So uh, say we go through the mass. You know, the purificator is to essentially just ensure that the precious blood is not going to drip down the side of the chalice or fall to the ground. the ground. How often do you get lipstick on them, boys? Well, this is the presider's chalice, so I really don't share uh, from this Nor chalice. Nor does he wear lipstick. Oh, and, which is, <laughs> that too. Yeah. Um, but yeah, lipstick on you know the communal chalices um, all the time. You know, so you'll see a lot of lipstick on purificators. Um, but again, I always tell my my ministers of Holy Communion, uh, the extraordinary ministers, that you're not you're not removing the germs from the chalice. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, you sh you're just really ensuring your reverence for the Blessed Sacrament On under the, the precious blood that you're you're taking care of the outside of the chalice. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that it doesn't drip down the outside. Exactly. Right. Right. Um, okay. So like, I, I see like the patent. And and the 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 extensive way that the church uh, goes in order to save and, and preserve the Eucharist just for ingestion for yeah. consummation, um, the the purificator now has the precious blood of our Lord on it. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't seem you just I mean, can't put that in the wash. You, yeah, you, no, you can't. There. What do you yeah, do? So what so do typically, so the... for example, I'll just kind of go through the steps. So the fractioning right takes place over the chalice. Yep. Um, you know, a little piece would then be mingled with the precious blood. Mm -hmm. And then when there's, when there's a uh, communion for the, for the priest, you know, may the body and blood of Christ keep me safe for eternal life. Amen. And then I would receive the host over the patent, as I was mentioning before. These are unconsecrated, by the way, just as a reminder. So always after the, after the point of receiving I then use my thumb for any of the any of the fragments uh, that are still on the paten over the chalice, and then I brush those into the chalice, and then I I wipe off the fragments from my thumb, and then I keep my fingers together, and then I consume the precious blood. Yeah, that's something I always thought was cool, and I don't know if people notice that that you're holding your your first finger and your thumb together throughout that whole process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and that's how I was trained to do it. Um, and then at distribution, you know, I'm, I'm holding things in that similar fashion. And then at the end of distribution, when I come back, um, typically it's this way, um, I'll hold my fingers over the ciboria, the same fingers that I use to touch the Blessed Sacrament, and then the water washes over the fingers, and then I use that water to then purify the remaining vessels. And then as that's going on and taking place, um, ultimately comes back to the chalice, I consume, and then I use the purificator to dry out all of the sacred vessels and then redress the chalice with first purificator, then patent, Paul, you fold up the corporal, and then you hand that off to uh, the to the altar servers with all of the sacred vessels. So, how do you clean the purificators? Because they they do have the so yeah. At the conclusion of the liturgy, um, you would soak the purificators in the sequarium. Okay, and which then, is a, which is a sink, which is but a sacred sink. And one of the cool things sacred. about that sink is that it doesn't go into the city plumbing; it goes directly into the earth. And right. it's under it's underground and in, in the in the earth that is blessed and made a church. Yeah. So it's almost like a pro, almost like the theology of a proper burial. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. It doesn't go into the city water supply. It's a pipe straight into the earth. Mm -hmm. That then that water. Goes that's in there. pretty cool. Isn't so, like, that so that's like if you ever find a leftover Eucharist that has become unedible, right? It like say like it was left in, in a in a uh, ciborium too long and he can't eat it, you dissolve it in there and then it goes mm -hmm. down, you dissolve it in the water and then it goes down. And that's the way, mm -hmm. the only proper way to dispose Correct. of consecrated. So water, just water. Uh, practically speaking, if it's going into the ground, uh, like, and you use that sink a lot, like it's just going into the earth itself or do mm -hmm. you dig a big hole or no it's already it's already been piped so that that's already been done with the construction of a aquarium it goes right into underneath the church yeah it goes into the ground there's no like hole down there it's just 
mm. diffuses through mm-hmm. the through the earth. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, you know, hopefully this show w- has been informative for you. I hope that you've enjoyed if you've been watching on YouTube. Um, you know, th- these vessels are very near and dear to my heart. They've been handed down to me, that, I, and I, I do genuinely cherish them and love celebrating Mass as a, as a Catholic priest. It's the thing that I absolutely love doing. It, it keeps me, you know, stable and, and in a good direction in life. And, uh, you know, as we continue to grow in our devotion to Christ, th- this is another step to learn what are the vessels that we use and, and what do they symbolize and, and how to properly care for them and prepare them? Yeah, this is, this is a cool episode. Yeah. I think this is the second best way to learn about the vessels. The best way is to, you know, go to Mass. Yourself, go to Mass. Right? Yeah. Absolutely. But I think a lot of people probably don't know this unless they were altar servers at some point in their life or, you know, former seminarians like this kid over here, right? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, thanks for bringing these all in. I think this a lot of our uh, listeners are going to you know, get a lot out of this. Yep. Yeah. Awesome. All right, guys. Well, God bless you, and we'll see you next week. Mm-hmm.